So yesterday, we kicked off Earth Week here at EPRI um, with a conversation uh, with Neil Wilmshurst and Rob Chapman, and they were focused on um, the global, collaborative, all-hands-on-deck approach um, that will be necessary for decarbonization. And they talked about the energy sector and how it is one component among many that are critical to ensuring that everyone is fairly represented and that the changes we make are sustainable. And so similarly, uh, within the energy sector, sources of energy are interdependent and um, all are playing a critical role on the path to decarbonization. So what can you tell us specifically about nuclear's role in decarbonization? Nuclear will play an absolutely vital role in our journey to decarbonize um, not only the electric sector, but, but the energy sector writ large. And I believe yesterday, Neil and Rob talked about a couple things, you know, in, in addition to decarbonization, they talked about electrification. So when we talk about, for example, the transportation sector and electric vehicles, uh, electric buses, electrification is going to be a huge um, focus of, of our decarbonization efforts as well. Um, and then resiliency is another uh, facet where nuclear will certainly, again, be a powerhouse, no pun intended, um, in, in this effort. And, and so when we talk about nuclear and the different um, other players in the energy sector, you, you think about sort of a portfolio of options. And I like to think of it as a pie chart. And I tell folks, there's enough pie for everybody. And so nuclear will play a very key role. We have always been a clean energy source. And so it's not that we're adjusting something or making some, some tweaks to the technology to make it clean. It's always been a clean source. So, so I think that's, that's why nuclear certainly needs to be part of the conversation. And, and just to put things in perspective, this, this small pellet here, um, which is about the size of a pencil eraser, a little bit bigger, um, is a, it's a surrogate fuel pellet, so it's fake, but it's, it's the amount of uranium that is equivalent to produce, it produces enough energy that's the equivalent of 149 gallons of oil or one ton of coal or 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas. So the amount of material that's needed for a nuclear power plant to produce an equivalent amount of, electric, of electricity and output um, is quite small in terms of the volume of material. And we call that uh, high energy density mm -hmm. fuel. Um, and, and we did talk a little bit more about, um, you know, it, it is Earth Week, and, and I wanted to, to bring up um, one book to share with you real quick. So uh, this is the Lorax. Um, for those of you that um, have kids, you might be familiar with it. If you ever were a kid, you might be familiar <laughs> with it. Uh, and for those that aren't familiar, though, the Lorax is a book about trees. And these trees start to get cut down to be used for other purposes. And it starts to um, really uh, deteriorate an entire ecosystem. So not only the trees, but the fruits that, that um, were being used for, uh, and eaten from the trees, the, that population starts to die off and go away. And, and basically what it is, is it says that, you know, unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. You're in charge of the last of the truffula seeds, and the truffula trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffula, treat it with care. Give it clean water and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest, protect it from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his, his friends may come back. And that synopsis is really similar to what we are experiencing around the world today with respect to climate change. And so I really do sincerely view nuclear as a key part of making sure that we not only reverse what we're seeing in the environment, but hopefully get us to 
even a negative kind of um, impact. And so nuclear's place in the clean energy transition is absolutely vital. So you brought up the environmental piece so well through the lower acts there. Let's talk about the environmental impact and misconceptions around nuclear in that space and how we go about dispelling those misconceptions. So um, I, I, I talked about the, the fuel, right? How energy dense it is and how small um, a, a, of a volume you need. Um, and then there's, there's other aspects to nuclear as well. So it's not just an electricity generating source. We can also then use process heat from nuclear energy. We can use that heat to not, not only um, heat, heat communities, but if it's, if it's high temperature heat, you can use that for other activities like desalination of water for generation of hydrogen. And in a poetic way, you can use that hydrogen then to fuel a bus fleet, for example. And so now you have not only electricity being generated, you're also starting to take a dent out of the transportation sector um, by, by providing it hydrogen that was generated by that nuclear plant down the street. Um, the other really um, key area about nuclear energy that I want to talk about is, is the workforce. And so it takes a lot of different talents um, to make this industry successful. And we in the industry have a lot of good paying jobs. Um, and it takes not only, you know, straight out of high school, you could be in this, in this field making substantial contributions um, all the way through, you know, we've got folks that, that went to four-year college, two-year college, um, went on to get doctorates. It takes a, a huge diverse organization for all, for all of us to be successful. And so I think um, that's another area where, where we need to share that good news um, with folks. Um, the, the third area I wanted to touch on was the really neat research and development that we get to do. And at EPRI, that's, that's really where we shine. We have numerous different research and development programs. We get to work on cutting edge technology. Um, the, when you talk about drones and artificial intelligence and big data, advanced manufacturing, those are all areas that EPRI is working on and creating state-of-the-art research and development uh, results that our members and the, the industry and the public at large will benefit from. Mm -hmm. Great. So speaking of R&D and technology, let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, technology is going to be so very important to taking nuclear power plant operation to the next level in this decarbonization and clean energy future. So can you speak, <clears throat> excuse me, in a little more detail about some of the specific technologies that are either in the pipeline or already available that can assist nuclear power plants as they ramp up to this new clean energy future? Sure. So again, the role of the existing fleet, the existing nuclear power plants is vital because they are a clean energy source. They always have been. Um, and so the plants currently um, are, are operating um, as, as planned, but they are going to be able to operate for 10, 20, even 40 years and beyond their um, expected current, current, current lifetimes. And what they need to do is apply for what's called um, subsequent license renewal. And so we see plants doing that. Um, and once that happens, um, it's, it's really the cheapest way the most inexpensive way for a electricity generating source to contribute to a clean energy economy because the plant's already built, it's already been operating for decades, and all we're saying is you can, you know, we as a, as a community, the regulator is the one who decides this, but you can continue to operate for 10, 20 years more. And, and so where EPRI comes in is that we are developing technology to aid in um, those extended operations, including machine learning based operations, including drone inspections, and including technology that's based around predictive maintenance. Um, and then let's move on to um, 
uh, digital instrumentation and controls. So, so many of these plants were built decades ago. They had analog systems. And so EPRI is assisting, uh, has assisted with the research and technolo development uh, techno of technology where you can convert that analog system to a digital system. And then um, the last thing I want to talk about in this space is new plants, new technologies. We've got advanced reactor technologies that start from micro reactors, so they're smaller, to small modular reactors at 300 megawatts or, or smaller, to gigawatt-sized reactors, which is really what um, folks are accustomed to thinking about when they think about a nuclear power plant. And so we have a breadth of sizes. We have a breadth of technologies as well. And so what that does is it allows for uh, the customer, the end user, to decide which, which class do I need to suit my needs? If I am a remote community that currently gets hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel trucked in annually, I might have a different need than an urban community who already has a nuclear power plant but might need one more. Um, if I work in a defense-related industry, I might have a different need. Or if I am a newcomer and I have never used nuclear technology before and I want to try one SMR, I can do that and then think about adding different modules to it as, as I get more comfortable. Exciting times. Lots of technology coming down the pike or at play to enable this decarbonization. And so along with that technology, um, Neil alluded yesterday to the fact that um, a trained workforce and preparedness is going to be really key to ramping that up. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about workforce readiness and EPRI's role in that as we move into the clean energy future? Absolutely. So let's start with how we actually even get a workforce. Um, and I think the key here is to ensuring that students, K through 12, understand that the nuclear industry is something that they can enter into as, as a job option. And, and so what that means is making sure that we in the community already, in, in the industry already, go and visit those schools, talk to those students about what we do, um, have seminars with university students as, op you know, these are, these are the job options that you might have once you come out of school. Um, for, for example, for students coming out of high school, we in the industry need lots of crafts and trade people, mm -hmm. tradespeople. And so, you know, welders, um, the folks that help build, are going to help build these new power plants, we need those skill sets. And so to make sure that, one, we're educating students about what options are out there, um, enabling them to consider us um, as a, their career path, and then providing guidance where need be. So if you're a student and are interested, um, certainly you could reach out to um, us in the industry for more information. Um, but I also want to add that it's not just, it's not just it's science, technology, engineering, oh, those are all careers that are, are vital to this industry, but we need so much more. We need, we need the, the, the finance folks, we need accounting, we need, um, like I mentioned, the welders as well. We need all sorts of diversity of thought, diversity of experience. Um, I have worked with art majors, English majors, who have, who, who have impacted my career for the better. And so, again, if, if you want to pursue engineering, that's fantastic, and I welcome that. But if you choose not to, we still need you in the industry. And so that's, that's the student side of things. Now, we, let, let's talk about what EPRI is very, very specifically doing, and that is working on what's called common, core, or common curriculum training. And that's, we, we call that EPRI U. And what we have done and continue to do is develop common training that our members can use and, and train their workforce with the most up-to-date, most relevant content without the members or, or the communities having to themselves develop this training. And so we, we take that off, the intent is for us to take that off their plate 
and have us develop that content, deliver the content, and it will be always uh, refreshed and kept up to date. And so, again, that's how EPRI is um, helping with the workforce of today and of the future. Great. Let's focus just a little bit on the global outlook. You know, there are probably some very specific considerations um, to decarbonization and nuclear's role in it outside the U.S. So if you could speak to those just a little bit and how nuclear is meeting the challenges outside the U.S. Oh, sure. So there's actually a lot more um, activity and build and excitement globally with respect to uh, nuclear, new nuclear builds um, and the exploration of nuclear, even, even coming to communities and countries that have never had nuclear power plants before. So I think globally, we are at a really good point in time um, for, for nuclear. And it's really exciting. And EPRI is thrilled to be able to contribute to that growth. Um, the, some, some of the um, exciting areas that we're working on include uh, reducing the cost for construction of new plants and looking at what needs to happen. And while it's not um, the most glamorous topic to some, I'm a materials engineer, so it is to me, but you know, looking at concrete and looking at how can you improve how we actually do the, the construction. Can we use advanced manufacturing techniques to put rebar in concrete in, in, in a component together simultaneously? And so those types of activities um, are occurring around the world. EPRI is participating um, in the research and development to assist that. And then the, the other side of the house is making sure that these new concepts, new designs, um, the, the licensing activity that happens um, and is certainly required, and, and that's the way everybody wants it, um, EPRI can, can and does also assist um, in providing the research and development that's needed for, for example, if um, new fuel needs to be qualified, for example. That is something where EPRI does play a part. Interesting. So I've heard you use the word exciting or excitement a couple of different times, and certainly your enthusiasm is um, very evident there. And so I guess I would just like to close by asking if there's anything in particular that you would like to add from your personal perspective um, regarding the future of nuclear and its role in the clean energy transition. So I, I want to share a story with you. Um, when I started in this industry, I, I can tell you that I really didn't know about the nuclear industry. And the way I ended up in my first job out of, out of school was through a headhunter who, through the mail, I got this form letter and they said, you know, fill these lines out and, and we'll see if you're a fit for any of our um, clients. And I was a match for one of their clients who happened to be Betis Atomic Power Laboratory at the time. And this was around the time where search engines were just kind of getting up to speed, and so I went and, and I searched for Betis Atomic Power Laboratory using um, Lycos, I believe it was, <laughs> it was a search engine, and I couldn't find anything about them. And so uh, you're supposed to do your homework before you go in for an interview, so I remember going onto the, uh, onto the um, uh, lab, lab site there, and I walked into the HR office, and I said, I'm, I apologize, I, I have no idea what you guys do. And they said, oh, that's fine. That's how we like it. And so I proceeded with the interview th through the day and, and realized what they did and why they, they were hiring me. And it was to work on advanced nuclear fuel for the Navy for the United States. And the reason I took that job was because of the research and development facilities at, at the laboratory. And during my time there, I, was, um, I, I drew the short straw so to speak, um, and I got to drive, but I got to drive a van full of summer interns to Newport News Shipyard, where I got to see the Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier being constructed and actually stand inside 
the reactor cavity where the actual nuclear reactor w would go. And I looked up several stories, and I realized that this little bit of fuel that I'm developing back in the laboratory is going to power this behemoth of a ship. So that was a turning point for me. The energy density of this little guy um, what, was what got me to stay in, in the field at the time, right? So let's, let's fast forward, because I know we're running out of time. Um, I have two children. They're typical snarky teenagers. <laughs> but I want them to inherit a world that is better than what it is today. And I believe with all my heart that what I am doing and what EPRI is doing and what the nuclear industry is doing will guarantee that they will inherit an earth that is better than it, what it is today. What a great place to wrap things up, I think. I'm not really sure where we are. I think we have a few minutes left. But um, I, this is a really important topic within the context of the wider conversation on decarbonization. And thank you for sharing your views and your enthusiasm and your, your insights with us. Um, we just managed to scratch the surface. We could talk for a lot longer, I'm sure. But um, we thank all of you for joining us as well. And we invite you to join us later today and throughout the week as our series on Earth Week activity um, and um, decarbonization continues. Uh, you can certainly find out more information about the sessions that are available by visiting EPRI.com. Um, but our remaining topics include electrification for a net zero world, the Low Carbon Resources Initiative Research Vision, and sustainability and equity in clean energy transition. So again, thank you so much for participating, and thank you, Rita, for the conversation. Thank you, Laura. This was great. Happy Earth Week, everybody. Happy Earth Week. Thank you.